Welcome everyone to um, what is actually going to be a pretty energizing uh, conversation after lunch. So uh, no pressure for our next presenter. Um, but I am actually super excited uh, because we're gonna learn five lessons learned implementing holograms in web-based AR. So a little bit about um, our speaker. Yoni has worked with WebXR for the past six years building web-based virtual uh, and augmented reality experiences for a w wide range of clients in a variety of different fields, it looks like. Um, also has received multiple awards across the VR and AR industry and looks to, to combine sleek UI, thoughtful UX, high quality 3D models, and has been able to create WebXR experiences that are memorable for users and push the needle for clients. Okay, I definitely need to pay attention in this talk. So um, he is also the book of, uh, the author of the book, What is Augmented Reality and What is Virtual Reality, available at Amazon. So I know you'll love it, so go out and grab the book. So on that, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. So yeah, my name is Yoni Binstock. I'm the lead web AR developer at Rock Paper Reality, and I'm so excited to talk about the five lessons we learned implementing holograms in web AR. So what are we going to be talking about today? First, we'll figure out what exactly is a hologram, and we'll dive straight into lessons. And lesson one will be the importance of pre-production for hologram creation. Lesson two will be about compression and optimization. We'll talk about the lessons that we learned and the tips and the tricks to fully optimize your holograms. Lesson three will be the interactions between your hologram and added 3D elements. Lesson four will be about the importance of shadows and how to give presence to your holograms. And lesson five will be alternatives to volumetric capture, including chroma key videos. So I know a lot of people have different definitions of a hologram, but ours is a hologram is a 3D visual representation of a character or a person in augmented and virtual reality. Holograms can add a physical human presence to an AR experience, and they are extremely high in demand. Now, with modern day technology and volumetric capture, brands can bring in celebrities, musicians, performers, and with web AR, they can bring them directly to the user without the need to download anything. Now, throughout this talk, I'll be talking about our partnership with Jackson Family Wines. Jackson Family Wines is a wine company, and they came to us last year with a problem. Their spokesperson, Adam, had started this company selling wine door to door. And it's a really compelling experience, a really compelling story. But obviously, that doesn't scale very well. So they, but they wanted to imitate that story. They still wanted that human-human connection. So we said, well, with volumetric capture, we can have Adam as a 3D model, not just as a 2D video. And with web AR, the user can access the experience through a QR code, through social media, through an email marketing campaign, without the need to download anything. Now, we were actually the first company in the world to bring holograms into web AR, and I can tell you it was quite a challenge, but the success speaks for itself. So lesson one, the importance of pre-production. So like any video creation, you're going to want to rehearse and practice and nail down your script, but with volumetric capture, the costs are incredibly high. So you need to make sure you have nailed down every specific detail before the day of the shoot. You want to pick costumes that reflect the brand, reflect the experience that you're creating, but you need to be careful about what articles of clothing you use because there are some articles that just won't work. So one is if you're using a green screen, obviously you shouldn't have anything green on you. Also, anything that's transparent or reflective won't be picked up by the cameras. So our recommendation is to work with whoever company you're working with for volumetric capture, making sure that the costume that you're gonna have your actor wear uh, is gonna work in the studio. And we also recommend to have a backup just in case that first one doesn't work. Like any project, it's really important to visualize and prototype this experience. And yes, you can use paper and pen at start, but 
what we did is we used 3D tools like Maya or Blender, and you can use virtual reality tools like Gravity Sketch and Tilt Brush to really visualize this three-dimensional experience. It really helps to visualize in three dimensions what is the actor going to do? How are they going to move it? What is the relationship between the end user and the hologram? You know, what is the size difference going to be? All this really can't be done very well in a two-dimensional medium. It kind of needs to be done in a 3D software tool. So one of the restrictions and limitations of WebAR is file size and downloading assets. So you want to do everything you possibly can to reduce that file size. So one is, unlike a MP4 video or a JPEG where you just quickly Google online a tool to compress your files, that doesn't really work well for an HCAP file, which is the file we got from Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Studio. You need to work with specific software. Uh, we use Arturus that really helped us reduce that file size. Secondly, is you want to work with whoever is doing the volumetric capture for you and communicate your restrictions, your limitations. So Microsoft was an amazing partner in communicating what they can do in working with us and giving us a file that we could use in our web AR experience. We also, we, at first, we were thinking about creating a longer experience, but one is we realized it was going to cost a lot more money with an extended timeline at the shoot, but also we realized that the file size would just get too large at the time that we were thinking. So you need to look at the limitations of the file size, and that might determine the length of the experience, the length of your actor performing. So even though we were got a custom compression tool, we had help from Microsoft, we minimized the length of the experience. When we, when we got all that together, we learned that the user was still waiting too long. They were leaving, they were bouncing. So what did we do? Well, we had a tutorial that the user was going to go through anyways, and we put that at the first screen. So while the assets are loading in the background, the user is engaging with this experience, they're interacting, they're reading, they're watching, they're swiping, and that way the user isn't just stuck. So my recommendation is have the user engage somehow. Maybe it's a tutorial, maybe it's a video, uh, maybe it's just a progress bar. Just whatever you do, just don't have a static screen because uh, the user is going to think the experience is broken. Lesson three, holograms and 3D elements. So at Rock Paper Reality, I think what we're known for is mixing the physical and the digital world. I also think that's when augmented reality really becomes magical. So for example, just last week, we finished a project with uh, De Bortoli, another wine company, and as you scan the wine label, a digital clone of that bottle is in the exact same scale and position. And what that allowed us to do is, as we had animals kind of crawling around and slithering around this bottle, they were occluded by the digital bottle. And that way, it was almost hard to imagine that these animals weren't there, that it seemed like they were really there in the real world. And with Jackson Family Wines, we had Adam come out of the bottle. And that was just a really compelling experience. Users had never seen that before. And so our recommendation is figure out how you can make a digital clone of the physical item you're interacting with and use occlusion to uh, make the physical bottle act as a digital bottle or any physical item. But not everything can be captured in a capture studio. So either for cost reasons or safety reasons or size limitations. I'll give you an example. Um, we had a scenario where Adam was kind of covered by all the awards that Siduri had received. Uh, but we really couldn't do that because that would injure him. We, we didn't want to do that. And so we had him pretend that things were falling on top of him. And then in post, we were able to add 3D elements with physics. They were able to surround him and immerse him in this experience. And that worked out really well. And in another case, we had him hold a wine bottle during the shoot. And then we quickly realized, oh, that wine bottle is super you know, transparent and reflective, and it's not being picked up by the cameras. So we had to take out that bottle and put in a substitute 
item that was roughly the same size and shape. And then in post, we were able to replace that fake bottle with a digital one. And lastly is um, we had a scenario where we really wanted his clothes to kind of fly behind him in a very windy scenario. We thought it would look really cool as in a hologram, really to add a dimensionality to it. But we knew that doing it in post was actually going to be really difficult. But so what we did, we, we, <laughs> we bought a leaf blower. And we had it outside of the, the capture area. And we were blowing him with the leaf blower. And his clothes were flying around. And it worked out really well. So our recommendation is figure out how you can mix the physical and the digital. Figure out what items you can put as props in the environment during the day of the shoot. And, figure out what items you need to add in post. So shadows are critical in adding a presence and a weight to your holograms. If you don't, what happens is they just seem that they're floating up in the air. So you need three things to have a shadow. You need to have the hologram, you need to have a light source, and you need to have a digital floor that can receive the shadows. Now you can do shadows in two different ways. You can have a, a static shadow, that doesn't move, maybe it's a semi-transparent PNG, or you can have a dynamic shadow that changes as the hologram moves or potentially as the lights move. When you have dynamic shadows, it really creates immersion uh, and presence for these holograms. Just to note, there is a performance cost to adding shadows, um, but if you can, we highly recommend you include them. So for a variety of reasons, including cost, maybe location, um, your brand, your client, your agency may not be able to do volumetric capture. What we recommend is chroma key videos. So around the world, you have recording studios that have green screen recordings, and we've done that for years. And what we can do is we can take that MP4 file with that actor and the green screen, and we can chroma key that green screen out. So it, so that's transparent. And that way, we have this two-dimensional video, the transparent background. It really seems like it's in your scene, in your augmented reality scene. And we do one other thing that kind of makes it magical or adds a little bit more immersion, is we add a, it's called a look at component, and we attach it to this 2D element. And we have it look at the camera, which is the user's phone. And so no matter where the user moves, no matter how the user rotates, this two-dimensional video is always rotating with it. So it's impossible for the user to get to the side or get behind. So they never see that it's just two-dimensional. And that way, the majority of users actually think it's three-dimensional, especially if you add a shadow. So in summary, our recommendation is to find a balance between the quality of the production, the size of the file, and the loading time you should look for opportunities for your hologram to interact with additional 3D content. To save time and money, take pre-production extremely seriously. Have shadows in your environment to create presence. And if you can't afford or location-wise, you just can't reach a volumetric capture studio, include a chroma key video instead. Now, our campaign with Jackson Family Wines was hugely successful. It led to 144 million impressions. And my favorite stat is that the average user spent five minutes through this experience. What that means is that they were watching, engaging throughout the entire experience. They were staying there until the end. What this means is that that user had a really close connection to the Jackson Family Wine. That means they were more likely to purchase their products, and other wine companies, and, and more besides wine, reached out to us because they saw the success. And I think volumetric capture and web AR is going to continue to be a huge part of our AR industry, and um, I'm really excited about it. Now, I want to offer the opportunity for you guys to check it out yourselves. So this is a QR code that you can scan with your camera app if you like. One thing I would ask, though, is that to put your phones on mute, because these do have sound effects, and we don't want cacophony of noises. Um, and it's going to lead you to the Jackson Family Wines website, 
where you can choose um, the three experiences that we built for them. Um, and you can see the volumetric capture of Adam interacting with the bottle, interacting with 3D elements, uh, and speaking to the user. Um, and then I'll leave that up, and I'll also leave it open to questions right now. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> Don't know if that microphone works, so here, let me uh, hand you this one. Hello. Oh, there Good deal. Works. Um, hi. Hi. So uh, I had a question about the lighting for some of your experiences. Have you ever done any uh, dynamic lighting that through the camera you can see where like the light source is based on color values and then have that light source be like put into the scene dynamically to cast shadows yeah. on, your, on your stuff? Can you, and could you talk a little bit more about that? So yeah, lighting is absolutely critical um, to, especially 3D modelers especially kind of know about this and we have a great 3D team. Um, so one is you can add um, ambient lighting, you can add directional lighting, you can add spot lighting. You can have lighting move, which is kind of cool, just in a, in a sphere so that the shadow continues to move around the user, even if the user or the hologram is staying still. Um, you can change the color of the lighting. You could toggle it on and off. Um, there is a lot you can do with lighting, and I think it is critical for both web AR developers and 3D generalists and just AR creators in general to like learn about lighting and dynamic lighting. Great question. Hey, I'm curious about um, if you thought about recording holograms, not volumetric capture, but rather maybe rigged avatars or actual recordings made in VR using um, VR head, like, you know, controllers and, and, uh, and a headset. Um, and if you've seen anyone doing that in any maybe uh, um, uh, inspiring examples of other types of a avatars and holograms other than volumetric capture? So, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, you can use, I'd say like any 3D character, um, animals or, or creatures, monsters. Um, we never done something that was created in virtual reality and brought it to augmented reality. Um, I imagine you could though. Um, I think holograms, especially like kind of personal holograms, like human holograms, are great because they have this human to human connection, this eye contact that really resonates with customers. Uh, but yeah, you could do it, something like this with, with other creatures and other 3D models and avatars. Um, what considerations do you have for target devices? So how do you change your pre-production planning and your quality considerations if your target is mobile versus if your target is something that's gonna have a higher fidelity screen? Mm. Great question. So we focus on uh, web AR through your mobile browser. So we are heavily restricted in you know, the computational power of your phone and graphics and all that stuff. One is I think having those constraints really helps you be creative. I think the more constraints you have, the more creative you are. Um, but if you had a headset augmented reality device, then you will have more flexibility. You could have a longer experience. You could have multiple uh, holograms in the scene. You could have uh, more like videos and 360 environments. You could just add so much more. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to build some stuff with a headset AR, but right now we're focusing on mobile web AR. So you talked about bounce rates and yeah. that uh, users were going away. A, what was that bounce rate? I'm curious what you consider too long of a bounce rate before users lose interest and, and go on. Mm. And then what are some tips? We all know compression is incredibly important, but that's a, a art as much as it is a science. Yeah. So what are some tips on how to get down that compression to get that on specifically like WebXR? Yeah. Um, in terms of the exact bounce rates when we were first testing it, not sure about that, but it was, it was at a level that was unacceptable to us. Um, and it was, just, it was beyond what was our normal web AR experiences. So we just knew it was abnormal. We knew it was just too long. Um, and we wanted to reduce that bounce rate as much as possible. Um, besides you know, the tools of you know, Arturo, working with your volumetric capture studio, for example, Microsoft, um, 
and limiting the length of the experience, um, there's not much you can do. Well, one, here's one other thing you can do is instead of loading all the assets at the beginning, you can progressively load them throughout the experience. There is some risk to that, because if you get to the part where the asset's needed and it hasn't downloaded yet, you just gotta build fallbacks for that. Um, but at the same time, it allows you to just get users into the experience as quickly as possible. We found it safer um, to have the, all the assets load at the beginning, even if it takes a, you know, a few seconds longer. Awesome. All right, well, a big round of applause for our very amazing speaker here. And thank you for putting up an example of, of something that people can check out. That's something I, I don't know why they don't do. And if you have a, a moment afterwards, uh, Declan had a question that he was unable to get. So if you don't mind being just uh, outside the door and okay. uh, getting that, because I want to make sure everyone gets their, their questions uh, answered. So uh, again, thank you very much. Um, stick around, folks. And uh, under about, it looks like under 10 minutes, uh, we're going to have our next session, which is virtual reality for social impact in Haiti. Um, don't forget, uh, there is um, good networking going on, uh, events uh, tonight, and if you are enjoying uh, what you see, make sure to tag the different speakers and also the hashtag AWE2021. So stick around, we'll start our next session in a few minutes.